Well, that is really a hard act to follow, as I'm sure you know. I don't want any voting here, but how many of you think that I'll finish on time? <laughs> we're, we're getting back to like old times. I'm not going to keep you till the quarter till six, though, I promise. We had that situation last week, of course, because about, I guess, five of us talking. But uh, anyway, we will keep us a little bit more uh, than usual today. I just talked to Mr. Herbert Armstrong about uh, an hour before services began and uh, visited with him, I guess, 30 or 40 minutes, and he is feeling uh, all right, although he does have a little bit of return of the fever. It's not bad, but at any rate, he's still fighting the flu and hoping and praying that he will be back in time, you know, for the conference as far as back to health again. So I hope you'll be praying for him. But he is positive that we are going to win a victory in this thing, and of course he knows God is with us, and I'm sure you all know that too. And uh, I hope all of you will be praying about it very, very much. Uh, I'd like to... Uh, comment on rumors that have been going around. All kinds of rumors have been going on around here and there, and I'll talk on some of them a little bit during the sermon, but a lot of them are, you know, strange rumors and odd rumors and wild rumors and weird rumors. Some of them are good rumors. And I want to confirm one rumor we're adding to the church. You saw the little children here, and uh, my wife, Cheryl, just informed me that we are going to add to the church. So I'm very uh, pleased with that. <laughs> She just found out, I think it was day before yesterday for sure, and uh, I, I've been saying I'm too old, and she's saying, no, you're not. So uh, anyway, that's the way it goes about the middle of next August for all of you other curiosity seekers. Anyway, uh, another happy announcement, and I hope it can be happy to you in the right way, brethren, if we are united behind God and his apostle. Uh, people have been talking about the fact, well, is there a board and who's on the board and, uh, you know, skepticism of this and that. And I want to tell you from my experience, as Dr. Hay could, Mr. McNair could, and all of us who've been with Mr. Armstrong from the very beginning, that is the earliest years of the college, he does get hours and hours of, con of, of uh, you know, counsel on the big things that are happening in God's work. He always has, and he's on the phone constantly with different ones of us about situations that come up. And I have been on the board off and on for many, many years myself uh, in God's church, the church board, the college board, and so on, as you, many of you know. But Mr. Armstrong sent this telex dated January the 9th, four days ago, and we got it here from this special telex-type machine that comes from his home, and it's been confirmed by Mr. Helge and by the others here who are going to make it official, of course, and get it in the notes. But it's uh, written here to Ralph K. Helge, Secretary, Board of Trustees, Worldwide Church of God, Pasadena, California. Dear Mr. Helge, at this time I wish to notify you of a change and or addition to the members of the church board. I confirm that of and from this date the members of said board are Herbert W. Armstrong, Chairman. I think all of you, of course, know who he is. <laughs> Has some idea about that. Stanley R. Rader, Treasurer. I know he needs no introduction to you except to say that he's been with God's work for over 20 years. A lot of you did not know that, and some people are saying, well, who is he? Well, he's been with God's work for over 20 years, and I remember eating lunch with Mr. Rader and, and uh, Mr. Matson and others way back, and Mr. Michael, Mr. Gene Michael and others way back in uh, the 1950s, of course, when he was helping us out and coming over to a little tiny college at that time and giving up time from his own accountancy practice in uh, Beverly Hills and coming over here to help our little college back when we didn't have very much. And I won't give a sermon on that, but if you know the story, you can kind of figure it out. Ellis LaRavia. Ellis LaRavia, of course, has been with us many, many years in God's work, and of course all of us here know that he is the facilities manager, a very dedicated man, a preaching elder in the Church of God. Mr. Richard Rice. Mr. Richard Rice. And, of course, Mr. Rice has been in God's ministry. I don't really know. I didn't try to get autobiographies of all these men, but I thought I should tell you about them for anyone who doesn't know them. As I remember, Mr. Rice has been in God's ministry about 20, probably over 20 years in God's ministry. He's been stationed as the pastor of the Birmingham Church back in Alabama and various other places. No, I should say Birmingham, excuse me. I learned to say Birmingham over in England, <laughs> Birmingham, and uh, many other places. I think in Big Sandy he was the pastor, and uh, uh, many other places all over the field, known and loved as one of the most dedicated and clean-cut 
and sort of, uh, I don't know, whatever you'd say, just a dedicated, humble servant of God. And I think most of you know that that are here. But in case you don't know, that is Mr. Rice's reputation. Mr. Raymond McNair, and of course all of you know him, I trust, by now, one of the three pioneer evangelists ordained by Mr. Armstrong over 26 years ago, a man who came here when we had nothing, we were nothing, all of us who came at that time did not expect any salary. We made less after graduation, after we were made evangelists, than we were making in summer jobs between high years of high school and high school and junior college. I made more during my summer jobs working in a logging camp or in the, uh, you know, this and that type of industry, uh, a, a sort of a maintenance crew for the Bureau of Reclamation up in Idaho before coming to college on those various summer jobs that I made for two or three years after coming here, if you got your paycheck. I think Mr. Lindsay sitting here and others remember that problem. So uh, a lot of us have been through a lot of those things together. I'm listed next. He's added me again to the Board of Trustees of the Worldwide Church. And most of you know me uh, as one of the, of course, Mr. McNair and Dr. Hay and I are the three left of the original pioneer evangelists, the seven ordained uh, 26 years ago last December 20th. Debar Pardian, again a man who's been in God's work for over 20 years and been in Christ's ministry for nearly that amount of time, the voice of the world tomorrow in French, who built up the French work, the French broadcast, the French plain truth from nothing. And God has done that through that man. He is now on the board of trustees of the Worldwide Church of God. Mr. Dennis Luker, graduating 15 and a half years ago from Ambassador College in the ministry for years in Central California, district superintendent there finally, district superintendent over the Minneapolis district, uh, later brought in here to assist in the church administration department for about four and a half years, then down to Australia for nearly five years as director of the entire work in Australia and now back to headquarters again as he will be moving back by the, by the way to help on our headquarters team here assisting me in the churches worldwide Mr. Dennis Luker and finally just in alphabetical order or for whatever reason certainly not least Mr. Leon Walker again a man who's been in God's ministry about 20 years a very dedicated man and a man of course who is now the acting dean of Ambassador College since they kicked me out up there and uh, I've been sent down here. I'm kidding. I don't want anyone to worry about that. Sometimes you don't know what people are thinking. I've been appointed director of church administration, uh, but, you know, I can't have both jobs. So Mr. McNair and I joined in recommending Mr. Walker as the acting dean of Ambassador College, which he is now. So he'll be added to the board. There they are, nine men, Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Rader, Mr. LaRavia, Mr. Richard Rice, Mr. Raymond McNair, myself, Mr. D. Barapartian, Dennis Luker, and Leon. Walker. I hope that uh, that will help you to understand who is on the church board and if anything should happen to Mr. Armstrong who would be here working together and have responsibility under Christ and not think, well, spooky things could happen. If you know us and where every last one of us have stood for so many, many years, I think you can recognize that this work is our life and it has been for a long, long time. This work is our life. Most of us have been in this work over 20 years. And uh, the men on the church board have been loyal and faithful to Mr. Armstrong all during that time. So I hope that is a happy announcement to all of you. And I thought I got Mr. Armstrong's permission to make it today. And I think it is appropriate at this time what he did on January the 9th. I'd like to give you some facts today about why God's church will always be my church. Why God's church will always be my church. I've told you some things of this sort before, but... I want to review a few things of just my own past, and you think along in your life, what happened to you? I grew up in the Midwest, in southwest Missouri, and I was in the Methodist church. And I, of course, studied the Bible a little bit, but very little bit, as most of us do in different churches uh, beside God's church. I knew a little bit about the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer, and I think the Golden Rule. And if you got away from there, man, I was lost, <laughs> and I really didn't know much beyond that. But nevertheless, I began to have a desire for knowledge and understanding of the purpose of life. And I began to go into things like hypnotism and spiritism and mind power and this and that, as most teenage boys do. In fact, I went into magic. 
and uh, got my mother to sew me a magic table where you put the black felt and then strips across, uh, bright strips, and then you have the secret pocket between these these uh, st- bright stripes so you can't see the secret pockets, you know, and you pull your tricks with your magic table. And I was trying to understand things, as most kids do go through those stages, but I think I have that a little bit more than others. And the one that I went into those things the most with was also my wrestling buddy. He and I used to wrestle like two little bear cubs hour after hour on the green lawns back in Missouri. And we would roll around and try tricks on each other, judo tricks and wrestling tricks. And uh, I really loved the friend, although I had several friends. I went with a gang and not always one. But he was one of my two or three best friends for many, many years. His name was Jimmy Mallett. His father was an attorney. And he was the prosecuting attorney of Jasper County. Russell Mallett. He rejoined a physical education club headed by Wild Red Berry. Some of you older people from the Midwest may remember him. He was a famous wrestler back in the 1940s, Wild Red Berry, and he had this physical education club, and Jimmy went over there one Labor Day when I was down at my parents' cabin, and uh, they had a wrestling exhibition. Jimmy's partner was sick or something in his weight class, so they put him in with a boy who was about 20, 25 pounds heavier in another weight class. It was a cool night, a cool Labor Day, rather than being hot as it usually is in the Midwest at that time. And they didn't warm up, and their muscles, I guess, were stiff. And so just very shortly into the match, apparently just three or four minutes into the wrestling match with this bigger boy, why the boy grabbed him in a headlock, and Jimmy did what he and I had done so many hundreds of times together, and I mean hundreds of times. He, he uh, put his hands against the other man's body, kicked out so he could get out of the headlock, and just as he kicked one direction, the boy jerked the other direction, and Jimmy Mallett had his neck broken, staggered to his feet in front of his own parents and his neck even then was to one side fell over dead and my father told me the next morning as we'd come back from our cabin he says Roddy he says we have to go through a lot of things in this life I was just a 15 year old boy and he said uh, you know life goes on and the sun rises again the next day and it always works out and he says there's something in the paper I want you to read and I want you to realize that things go on and life goes on and you just have to go on with it My father was not a preacher, but I remember he gave a little tiny sermonette before he showed me the morning paper because it had on the headlines there, and a small headline, I mean, not a major one, but it was a local paper, Jimmy Mallett, son of Russell Mallett, prosecuting attorney, killed in wrestling accident. And I read the story. A few days later, I went to his funeral. I was a pallbearer, saw his body go down in the ground the way they did back there. They used to let it down while you're still there, you know, and you hear coink, crank, crank, and the body goes down. And I thought, there goes Jimmy, my friend. And so I thought, why, you know, as you do, why? Why does God let this happen? And where is God? And is God real? And the God that Jimmy and I were trying to seek or the understanding of life, why are we here, where are we going, what is it really all about, began to beat in my head. And about that time, my uncle, Dr. C. Paul Meredith, had begun to hear Mr. Armstrong and asked me to hear one night. And so I did hear... And, of course, it made sense because I'd been reading a lot of different types of things, including sending off to the Rosicrucians and sending off to some guy named Dingle out here in L.A., a little meeting office. He was going to teach, teach us the secrets of, of, of the wisdom of Tibet and all this kind of stuff. And, of course, I'd read these great words and this and that, but then I was intelligent enough even at that age, at age 15 or 16, to figure out the great words and words, but it doesn't say anything. But Mr. Armstrong did say something. And he began to teach me about a way of life out of the Bible. And he made sense out of this book and about the examples and teachings of Jesus and about the Ten Commandments in a way that I'd never heard before in my Methodist church. I didn't hear that in the Presbyterian church that I visited with one of my other friends, Jimmy Porter, or in the other churches that I attended around from time to time as boys would visit or stay all night with each other and go to various churches and hear various religious broadcasts and as a little boy attend revivals, as they were called, with my old Methodist grandmother. Grandma would take her grandson along in hopes that something would happen, and it never did. (laughs) It just never did. But when Mr. Armstrong came on the radio and I began to hear him and check up on him and follow it in the Bible, I began to realize that that man made sense, and I knew that, that he did have a way of life that was right. I also, of course, heard him talking about prophecy, as I've explained. I heard him talking about the fact that Germany, although it was being pulverized by American bombers by, you know, day and British bombers by night, was going to rise again and be the head 
of the United States of Europe, no doubt one of the leading nations, and the great military and industrial power of Europe. A lot of people made fun of that, and my relatives made fun of it. And even after I came out here and went down to raise up the San Diego church in 1952, this woman made fun of it. And she said, it'll never happen. But I think all of you know it has happened. And Mr. Armstrong said, America and Britain are going to go down unless they repent and turn back to their God. And that has happened too. And he said that in a specific way. And he said, Britain came up first to her national greatness, and she'll no doubt go down first. And that's the way it's occurring. And he specifically said that the sea gates are going to be taken away from us, and we'll lose the Panama Canal, we'll lose the Straits of Gibraltar, we'll lose Suez, we'll lose Singapore and the Malacca Straits, we'll lose the tip around South America and South Africa. And of course, all of that is rapidly occurring, and about 80% of it has already occurred today. And he's the only one that's been saying that. I say the only one that's been saying that. This work of God, led by Mr. Armstrong. And so I came to realize that all this was true. And I came to Ambassador College to learn a way of life and to learn more about what he had to say. And when I came to Ambassador College, why, I found that when I'd get up in the morning to look around, Herman Hay was my first roommate, just he and I together in the room, no one else, why Herman was gone. And I thought, where did he go? I, really, I, I thought he was odd. I thought, where did he go? I'd get up one time I work, woke up early and looked for him. And I remember searching around the bathrooms and around the closets. And I couldn't find the guys anywhere. Most of them were just gone. I thought, this place is spooky. I really did. And then all of a sudden, I remember it was the McNair brothers emerging from this kind of side closet on the third floor of Mayfair, and it was like they'd, you know, been uh, chipmunks in a den or something. They came out, they were blinking their eyes, and finally I, I became, I think Raymond was the first one I asked. I remember asking one of them, and finally one of them admitted, they said, well, Rod, we're, we're praying. We get up early and pray in the morning. And I said, what do you do that for? I always said, now I lay me down to sleep at night, you know, for about 15 seconds. And that's all I knew. And, uh, well, you get up early in the morning and you pray to God and talk to God and you really get to, oh, that's interesting. And then I begin to hear Mr. Armstrong talk about prayer and about God being real and heard him pray and it not the kind of memorized oratorical prayers that I'd learned or heard ministers give, but a real prayer. And I begin to learn to pray and realize why the fellows had all disappeared that early in the morning from third floor Mayfair. And I began to participate in the Friday evening studies or bowl sessions we had where all the fellows, we didn't have a formal study Friday evening as we do now here, but we had our own on third floor Mayfair and Betty Bates was down on the first floor safe with Annie Mann. She was the only girl in college and the sister of all of us in that sense. But the fellows would all be sitting for an hour or two every Friday evening studying their Bibles and going back and forth in the King James and the Moffat and figuring this out and that out and getting all the scriptures on the millennium and all the scriptures on Christ's second coming or all the scriptures on prayer, all the scriptures on fasting, all the scriptures on this or that. And in those days we were learning things that became the basis, if you look back in the early 50s, for this great torrent of articles that began to come out in the Good News magazine, in the Plain Truth magazine. Things that, you know, had never been written on before, frankly, but they did begin to come out at that time. And so we began to talk over those things. And after an hour or two, there was, you know, it wasn't anything planned, but there was a sort of an unwritten rule that after about an hour and a half, you'd get tired, then everyone would drift down to one of the rooms and have some snacks or something, and then chat about the Bible and, and, and you know, iron sharpens iron and talk these things over and talk over world news and prophecy and the whole way of life. Life. And so we began to do that and build a way of life together in this work. And I found in those early fellows and the whole college and the whole work that there was total honesty and dedication and commitment, sacrifice. Mr. and Mrs. Herbert Armstrong putting their home up for sale, the only nice home they'd ever had since they came in God's church, had to put it up for sale twice. And that some of the people working right here who knew them best were the ones that insisted. Said, Herbert and Loma, don't do that. And Dr. Merrill and Dr. and Mrs. Lisman and Mrs. Mann and others kind of got together and helped get the money to make the payments so they didn't have to sell their home. But they had sold homes. They had moved into little motels or cheap apartments. And they hated to have them do that again. And Mr. Armstrong was still not driving that nice a car or doing this or that nice a thing, even though by now we're getting into the 50s and the college was going and he was the head of the college, the head of a broadcast, but had to be careful. And we all had to be careful in those years. And, of course, he'd already been that way about 20 years, as you know, in sacrifice in this work. 
And as Mr. and Mrs. Shepherd have told me, and Mr. and Mrs. Starkey, the first paid employees of God's work, that is Mrs. Starkey, how Mr. Armstrong used to walk over the hills, uh, you know, passing out these handbills, and how I had to put a cardboard in the bottom of his shoes to keep the rain out. And they saw him do it and helped him do it. And they've told me how Mr. Armstrong fastened his overcoat together with a safety pin because they said, you know, it was a depression, and if you don't have any money, you really don't have any money. I mean, a lot of us today and a lot of the young people, my kids, your kids, they can't understand that. But if there's absolutely no money, you don't even buy buttons. If you get the picture, there just isn't any money to buy anything with, so you don't even have buttons. And if you have a, you know, a safety pin, you fasten your coat together with that. And Mr. Armstrong was willing to sacrifice in all those years and all those ways to build up the work. And I was there. I saw a lot of it. I got to talk to a lot of those people who were not on the payroll then and up in the Willamette Valley and so on and so forth when I'd meet them up at the feast or work up there in the summer as Dr. Hay and Mr. McNair and I did in the woods or a hoeing mint or this or that and live in these people's homes and this type of thing. So I'm very grateful for that opportunity to see that kind of honesty and dedication and sacrifice that permeated this work all those years. I remember how we had a fellow named Herc was his nickname. And how Herc would come in on the third floor there with 12, 15, 20 fellows, whatever we had from year to year, all living together up there. And he always, he didn't have a billfold, and I better not imitate him, but he'd take, you know, he'd just take his money out of his pocket, and then he'd just kind of, kind of plop it right there on top of the dresser, and you'd always see Herc's bills fluttering there in the breeze. You know, he didn't have a lot, but three, five, seven dollars. It'd be worth about three times that much today, and what it would buy. And he'd plop it out there if he had that money at all, and some change. Well, no one ever thought, and I don't think anyone ever swiped one penny in Ambassador College in those years. It was just a way of life. We were trying to get closer to God. We were trying to recapture true values. And Mr. Armstrong took me to the first really nice restaurant I'd ever gone to. He had, you know, himself uh, brought over his hi-fi. We didn't have stereo then, but he brought his hi-fi over to the college, and he'd play the Grand Canyon Suite give us some semi-classical music and some Russian Cossack choir music to give us a little of that and then maybe Beethoven Fifth Symphony and then some Pops music and explain and talk about you don't have to have all heavy stuff but you ought to learn to appreciate the best quality of different types of music and try to honor God and have quality and have culture and be perfect like God is and to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And he taught a lot of us young guys those things in a way that our human fathers might never have done because they didn't understand. And he taught us to try to be ambassadors for Christ and to go into this world with Christ's message and work with us personally. And he and his wife gave of themselves. And Mrs. Armstrong, long before she had any title, years before she had any official office, I mean an office you walk in and shut the door, she was counseling the college girls for thousands of hours and helping them and was a second mother to them as Mr. Herbert Armstrong was a second father, of course, to all of us. And so we learned that way of life. Then a lot of us went out on the early baptizing tours. We didn't have churches. People would write in and say, I know you're the only true minister and you have the gospel. I want to be baptized by you or one of your representatives. So he'd send some of us out, even between our junior and senior year, if we were far enough along, or after graduation. I went on my first baptizing tour when I was 21 years old and between my junior and senior year. And I didn't know that I was ever going to be a preacher. In fact, Mr. Armstrong had tried to get me to preach the previous spring and I said no. And he had to kind of reason me into it and say, well, now, Rod, you know, you're student body president and all this, but you, you just give a talk to the students. And I said, you're trying to trick me, Mr. Armstrong. <laughs> and, and I remember, and he, well, you know, just tell the basic things you think the students and the people know, but you don't have to preach. Okay, okay. So I did. And uh, then he said, you know, he knew I was a preacher, but I, I still didn't know that. And, uh, but still, I, I didn't know I was going to be in God's work. I thought I was going to come out here and learn all this and then go back to the University of Missouri and finish my business administration course. That's what I wanted to do. But instead, when I came out here, I learned how different it was and I wanted to stay here and be in God's work. Well, that baptizing tour was a turning point. And I saw people that were three and four times my age, literally, and the first man I baptized, as I remembered, Mr. McNair might remember better and correct me, but one of the first ones I ever baptized was named A.M. Coffin, and he was, I think, 84 or 86 years old. He was approximately four times my age. <laughs> he could have been my great-grandfather, and I baptized him. 
We were young boys coming out in a college car, but wearing, uh, you know, slacks and white sleeves, sort of nylon shirts, because we had to, we wanted to look reasonably clean and all like this, and yet you didn't dress so much back then in the South. It was terribly hot. We didn't have an air-conditioned car, and it was hot everywhere. So we'd wear short-sleeved white shirts, and uh, often open below as people were wearing them then, so you'd get the circulation. And then we would wash them out every night. Nylon shirts we could wash out in the sink and hang them up over the shower and take off again the next day. But I'll tell you, on those tours, it was a changing of my life because I was meeting people who had been taught by Mr. Herbert Armstrong about the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Ten Commandments, about how to build the right kind of life, the right kind of family, and so on, in a way they had never heard. And those people would break down and bawl when we left. I mean that literally. They'd never heard anything like this. And they would break down and bawl when we left because they were so overcome, knowing that they would never see us again or might never see anyone from this work again, which several of them said. We didn't have any churches back there. And uh, they would often call us boys and be a little bit condescending during the first 10 or 25 minutes. But then Mr. McNair would open up on one with a barrage of scriptures and their eyes would begin to get a little bit wider. Wow, these young guys know something, you know. And then they would settle down and begin to answer or ask questions. And we were able to answer those questions. I know we had Adventist ministers and Baptist ministers and others that these people would unwisely, you know, invite their local preacher, Church of Christ preacher, or whatever he was, to kind of argue with us and come out. And they shouldn't have done that, but they would to say, well, here, here are the Armstrong boys and we're going to put them on the spot. And every single time we were able to put these guys on the spot and embarrass them so that they actually got up and left because we'd get them on the Sabbath, we'd get them on the Ten Commandments. And, the, and we found at age 21 that we knew more than men that were in their 40s, 50s, and 60s and were able to stop their mouths because we'd been taught the Bible, drilled on the Bible by God's apostle and understood the precious truth of Almighty God. Well, finally, we had churches raised up. And I'm, before I go to that, I want to describe the early feasts, though, at Belknap Springs, then Sigler Springs in Northern California, and then back at Big Sandy, especially Big Sandy. The great long lines of people to anoint and the lines of people where the husbands and wives couldn't talk to one another. And we had to counsel them and tell them how to work out their family problems because they were having so many family problems. And the wife would say, my husband won't talk to me and so on. And the children would always have colds and runny noses because they'd feed them candy and they'd feed them white flour and lots of, you know, sugary stuff. And they, they didn't understand the way of life. Finally, we had local churches and those people learned a way of life. Their children became more healthy, their marriages became more happy, and the people themselves, who were sort of poor people as a whole that God was calling, nearly every case, in spite of tithing, became more prosperous. And I'd go back year by year and visit them, and brethren, a lot of you know because you are some of them, some of you are here, Mr. and Mrs. Lee Seafack. Uh, Mrs. Catherwood's parents were some of those people Mr. McNair and I met on that first baptizing tour and Mr. Seafack came into God's work and a lot of those people developed themselves not that he was backwoods or anything like that he wasn't but a lot of those people developed themselves they became better off in every way and many of them became leaders in God's work and we've seen them later and we know that God's way of life works and God blessed those people and this church taught them that way of life and that way of life has been a blessing the way of life has been taught by God's apostle through his church. So later the local churches started and we were able to turn these people's lives around. And then we'd go back to the Feast of Tabernacles and see them. And I'll always remember the early feasts at Big Sandy, how, you know, when you tell a joke or make a special point, the brethren would actually, you know, just reverberate back to you with shining faces and love or applause or laughter or whatever because their lives were right. An absolutely ecstatic atmosphere in the Feast of Tabernacles from Almighty God because those people were happy and those people had had something that they had never had before and they realized it deeply and, boy, they appreciated it because they'd been taught by that man that servant of God, Herbert W. Armstrong, and the way of life that he taught all of us. Well, all of that is true, brethren, because we believe this book. This book and its teachings work, and we believe in preaching and teaching all of it, and we always will. We know the way. Some people, of course, have swavered a little bit from that way, may have tried to water down that way a little bit in recent years, but when it's practiced, and to the extent it's practiced, it works. 
We're the only church on earth teaching that way and preparing for the coming kingdom of God, the government of God on this earth specifically, to obey his laws and really understand what that government means. There isn't any other work doing that. And God has raised up Mr. Armstrong to teach that way of life to the world and to proclaim, of course, the prophecies of the coming kingdom of God to all nations. And he's trying sincerely, as God gives him wisdom and as God gives him guidance, to do that. He's subject to criticism in that. I always remember one of our kind of uh, uh, rebellious teachers who was not in the church way back in the college, back in 1950 or 51, and he was always talking about the Heavenly Father and the Son of God in his red chariot and kind of using kind of sarcastic humor because he was trying to liken Mr. Armstrong to the uh, Heavenly Father and Dick Armstrong to the Son of God in his red chariot because Dick had the little smaller size Plymouth convertible. Dick worked sometimes 40 to 80 hours, and I was with him, not that I worked there, but I was a friend of his and saw how he'd go out late at night and get these tapes, and he was paid by the hour. He wasn't paid a salary, but he was paid by the hour, and he did get an awfully long hours, and so after years of being the technician, the only technician in the radio studio, dubbing the tapes, taking them out, and all of this to the, to the airport and sh sending them all over to the stations, he was able to, on a payment plan, buy a Plymouth convertible. So this guy was trying to nail us on the affluence because of the affluence because Dick Armstrong had a Plymouth, not a Cadillac, but a Plymouth convertible. And because Mr. Armstrong ate over at Monty's Steakhouse, he was getting criticized back then for that. And everything else, all along the way, there's been criticism, criticism, criticism. Every time we do anything that somebody thinks that a preacher ought not do or some kind of a poor living in a cave type preacher ought not do. We're not supposed to be ambassadors for Christ. We're not supposed to be able to preach and reach kings and priests and talk to them on their level. Anytime we do that, anytime Mr. Armstrong has done that, a certain small minority criticizes and they evaluate and they judge and they condemn Mr. Armstrong and those assisting him. And brethren, I hope we can understand and I hope we can get you know, straight on that particular thing and realize that way of life that God has taught through his servant. That's the proof. That's the big thing. And my life has been turned around and I'll be everlastingly grateful to God and to Mr. Armstrong for doing that, for helping me to understand why Jimmy died and where Jimmy Mallet is now and when he's going to come up again. And my wife Margie and my dad who died about 15 years ago and all the other loved ones that we've known, Dick Armstrong and Ben Ray and the others who've gone before us in this church of God, people are going around sneering and, and a lot of sarcasm right now. The vultures are trying to descend upon us. They are going to find that we're a rather lively carcass. We're a very lively carcass, and we're going to fight back with the sword of the Spirit, not physical fighting. But we are not dead yet, and we are not going to die. But a lot of ex-members and a lot of ex-ministers and dissidents are circling and trying to make bright remarks and trying to contact some of you and trying to contact some of the, some of the new visiting ministers from overseas and find out when they're coming and get to them and say, do you know this and do you know that? And just give every kind of crazy, distorted, wild rumor that they can come up with to upset people often things that have no basis in fact whatsoever. And you know, if people just keep throwing out and throwing out that kind of rumor, how do you answer it? All you can do is say, brethren, why don't you say, where are your facts? Where is your proof to all of these wild, crazy allegations that you're making? And if we're such a wretched den of iniquity, how come all these people have, you know, a right way of life? How come this is the source that we're teaching them the Ten Commandments of God and the way of life from God? and all the rest of it. How come God is still using us to preach this message? In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, God says, Remember them who have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conduct. And brethren, you are to follow the faith and the approach of Mr. Armstrong as long as he follows Christ, and he's always said that, and you are to consider him. But he certainly has followed Christ, and he certainly has tried continually to set an example, certainly of culture, of quality. His desire for quality in the sense of staying in nice hotels and taking dignitaries to nice restaurants is nothing new. He's always done that according to his means. And his own son, who now criticizes him, has said, When God called my dad, he knew the kind of man he was calling. And I say that's true. 
When God called Mr. Armstrong, he knew the kind of man he was calling. He knew that he wasn't calling a kind of a backwoods preacher who would drive an old Model T and wear some out-of-date worn uh, J.C. Penney suits or something that were about to fall off or didn't fit right. He knew he was calling a man who could be an ambassador for Jesus Christ, who would be a kind of man to think big, and God who says, all the gold is mine and all the silver is mine. Maybe he'll say to Mr. Armstrong someday, and I'll just say, Mr. Armstrong, I hope you'll forgive me for saying this. Maybe he'll say to Mr. Armstrong one day, well, well, Herbert, I've had, you know, so many trillion dollars of gold and silver, you know, and you misspent one millionth of one percent of it, maybe, you know, somewhere. I don't think he did, but let's say if he did. But you got the work done, and I'm not worried. Could, could you think God is worried about it in that particular way? You'd better think once in a while from the point of view of the great creator and governor of the heavens and the earth and how he thinks. And if he calls a man like Daniel to stand before kings and address and to know how to do and to how to have banquets and how to entertain, if he called a, like, a man like Moses who was schooled in all the wisdom of the Egyptians to stand before the kings of his age and do this and that, uh, I wonder how many of the Israelites were saying, Well, Moses, you know, how come you wear a nice robe there when you go in to see Pharaoh? We don't understand what you're doing, you know. Really. How come you don't dress like the rest of us? Now, you think about it in that particular way. As Mr. Helge said, and I've had the ministers even and brethren come to me and just try to hit us and hit us and hit us. So where once in a while I say, all right, and I go back in my own mind and I've talked to people and I've analyzed and I've talked to Mr. Helge and I've talked to others around here. But I just have to tell you, brethren, that I don't know yet. And I've been in God's work now for about 30 years. And I don't know yet of one single solitary penny that anyone has stolen or ripped off the work with. It's been a matter of high quality in those particular trips and things where we're reaching kings and priests, kings and, uh, and, uh, and emperors and so forth, I should say, presidents. I'm a preacher. I said kings and priests. That's what we're going to be. <laughs> okay. Excuse the slip. But anyway, you know, and we can criticize that. And as I say, maybe maybe there's a tiny discrepancy there. I don't know. I can't sit over Mr. Armstrong's shoulder and say, Look, Mr. Armstrong, I came in as a young boy, and you'd built this whole work, and now you've got it here, and you have a quality auditorium. We've been willing to sacrifice all these years and ran hired halls. And I saw the man, brethren, and I did. And I sat with him in meetings way back in the late 1950s when he hoped someday we could have one quality house for God. And he hoped and dreamed and prayed about that, and finally God gave it to him and gave it to us, and here it is. And I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not. I'm not ashamed of it. And I think I've given about as many tithes and offerings from my salary, including a salary before I was a minister as a student and paying all three tithes and all the rest of it, but over the years as certainly more than the vast majority of you. But I'm not ashamed of it, and I don't think it's wrong for the church of God to have one really nice place. I noticed the very year we had the house of God and were criticized $11 million. Why, I was seeing in the paper, I guess it was three months, six months later, uh, that back in Washington, D.C., the Mormons were building one of their many, many temples. They're building all over the earth. And theirs was priced at $14.5 million. And they have a temple here and a temple there and a temple in Atlanta and a temple in Salt Lake and I think one in Chicago and I don't know where all they have them all over the earth. But, you know, this is the only one we have like that. Well, we get criticism. But I hope that we can understand that God looks at the way we've been taught and that the work is being done. And if it's done in a quality way, I don't think he's displeased with that. And I'm sure you're not either. But I hope, you know, just for the sake of those who are hearing in, that are wondering and wavering, that the rest of you who don't doubt can understand. That we can all be together in this. Verse 17, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they must watch for your souls as they must give account, and do it with, and that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. And in other words, we're to submit gladly and say, Well, Mr. Armstrong, you're in charge and that's your decision, you know, if it's something within God's law and so on. 
and not fight about it or argue about it. If there's something that's against God's law, why, obviously, you want to take it up with your local minister and we'll bring it to Mr. Armstrong and talk it over. And we certainly should and will and have, by the way, many, many times. And we'll continue to in ministerial conferences with him and discussion and the counsel that he wants us to give him. 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, and beginning in verse 14, the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, correcting them a little bit about something, he said, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though you have 10,000 tutors or teachers in Christ, a lot of would-be teachers, you know, appointing themselves to be teachers, as the Corinthians were all getting excited and wanting to teach each other when God hadn't called them yet, yet not have you not many fathers... There's only one man, he said, that is your father in the truth. I, the Apostle Paul, who laid the foundation here. And Mr. Armstrong could say the same thing. That's what he's done. He is as a father to us. He doesn't use that title, of course, and should not. But he is as a father, like the Apostle Paul was. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be you followers or imitators of me. Imitate me. Imitate me in seeking the right kind of culture and the right kind of quality and the right kind of manners and the right speaking for, for perfection in every way of your life. And we should imitate Mr. Armstrong and appreciate that he's wanted to honor the great God, as it says out on that plaque, in one building on earth after, as it is now, 45 years of this work of God. We have one really fine building for God in that sense. So he says, For this cause have I sent unto you Timothy, my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, the way of life that we've been taught, applying that today, from God's servant, Mr. Armstrong. And all of us evangelists, like Timothy did in his day, should bring you into remembrance of the way of God that God's servant, Mr. Armstrong, has taught us, my ways which be in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. And brethren, I hope you can remember those ways and be proud and be steadfast in the way you've been taught, the way of really fearing the Creator God of the Bible and wanting to obey the Ten Commandments, all of them, and see how they are even magnified spiritually and how to keep them from your heart, not just in the letter. The way to really be faithful to your husband and your wife until death, as Mr. Armstrong was to his wife for 50 solid years. The way he's taught by his teaching and by his example of service and sacrifice for 50 years. Be proud and steadfast in that way and remember the purity, but also remember the quality and the culture that Mr. Armstrong has always taught. Back in 2 Peter, 2 Peter, the uh, third chapter and verse 18, Peter tells us, Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Brethren, we do need to grow. There's no question about that. We have grown, we have changed, and we will grow and we will change in the future as time goes on. And I want to make a point of that because some people, again, some of these rumor mongers are rumoring around that because Mr. Armstrong is once again working with some of the earlier students that he trained directly and that have adhered to the way of life and the approach of the apostle, Dr. Hay and Mr. McNair and I and others, and I'm not trying to leave anyone else out. I'm just trying to use us. Maybe I should get a list, lest anyone be offended. Mr. Parting has certainly been that way. Mr. Luker, Mr. Walker, lots and lots of others out there in the ministry are that way. The vast majority of our member ministers and certainly members are that way. But because he's done that, some are saying, Oh, you guys are going to change everything back again. Well, let me just put this on record. We are not going to change everything back again. Mr. McNair was the one who went to Mr. Armstrong and got Pentecost changed. That is the way of counting. We didn't change Pentecost. We always believed it, observed it, understood its meaning, and we still do. But the one-third part of it, we understood we should keep it. We understood its meaning. Meaning that's not changed. But just the technical way of counting, we did change. And Mr. McNair was the one that got it done. And Mr. McNair, and I hope he won't mind me saying this, then they're going to say that Mr. McNair and I would change on divorce and remarriage or try to get that changed back. We would not. I'm serving record on that, giving notice on that right now. And uh, he would have to give up his wife, as most of you know, if we changed on that. So you just figure that out. You just figure that one out. These are crazy rumors, completely irresponsible and without foundation. 
Also, there's a rumor called into me just this morning from Salt Lake that some uh, person back there had mentioned or announced that uh, Mr. Steve Martin has been uh, disfellowshipped. Well, Mr. Steve Martin has not been disfellowshipped, nor you know just anyone that I know of except the four that I read you last time, and he is still in the ministry, and I'm sure will remain in the ministry, and so on. So let's uh, not only in the mem membership, but in the ministry. So let's just understand that there are rumors that are being spread by these vultures who are circling and circling, but they're going to find some very lively corpses here, and I hope that you'll be one of them. And as Winston Churchill said when uh, he was giving the talk to Britain during the Second World War, he said, if these Nazi fiends come down from the sky, he said, if they come down, you know, be sure that they do not think that they are lighting in the chicken coop, but in the lion's den. And I hope that all of you will provide the lion's den for these vultures who are trying to swoop down from the sky and pick on the carcasses of the weak brethren that they hope to turn away from the truth of God and from his work and from his apostle that has served him so many years. I hope that we can have that kind of attitude at this particular time. We're not going to change back on that or on makeup or get all buggy on hairstyles and skirt lengths. In fact, they may put me out here. I've been, been able to get a haircut for the last two weeks. Some of you know Mr. Patton has been ill, but uh, obviously we don't want men with hair down their backs like a woman but on the other hand we're not making a great huge issue of it uh, at all and we're just trying to teach a way of life as the apostle Paul did in the Bible we don't plan to go back on those things that are not the major things at all so let's just understand that Satan is trying to stir up these things and he's using human instruments and uh, he is trying to have a field day he will not succeed and I know that you and I will not let him succeed in Ephesians the sixth chapter Ephesians chapter 6, let's turn there and understand a little bit how this applies so much to us at this time. It says in verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against wicked spirits in high places. And brethren, there are demons, and they are circling around here, and I'm not kidding you. I get calls because of my new office. People are calling me, as they did from Salt Lake, from the East Coast, from here and there. Well, this group that used to, you know, this ex-minister and his friend are going here. And I find that this ex-minister and his people are over here, you know, in our dormitories and trying to contact new ministers coming in. And someone else is talking, talk, uh, talking to this member family and trying to upset that. And they're swooping down from all over. And Satan is trying to stir that up again against you because maybe he thinks that we won't fight. Well, we will fight. And I hope all of us have that attitude that we're going to fight for the truth of God. And when the chips are down, they're going to find that there is an army and that we are Christian soldiers and we are going to honor God and his servant and his work. So we wrestle against wicked spirits and high places. One of our members writes in and printed in a pretty good article here. I'm glad they at least give a little tiny bit of the other side of the story. The headline says, He's furious at simile and ambassador's story. I am furious at that article, Ambassador Breach Like a Death in the Family, that appeared on the front page of the January 9th Star News. It's nothing but a piece of propaganda on behalf of the plaintiffs in a lawsuit against an organization with which they have become disenchanted. If the Worldwide Church of God is just like one big family, as Mr. Timmons says, the interviewee, uh, then as far as the family is concerned, he's one of those who has died. Now, I realize that playing up scandalous accusations, heated diatribes, and court battles sells newspapers. And you need to realize that. I was noticing the paper day before yesterday, the Star News, and I can't remember the headline, but Church of God put down. That was the idea. And then you read the, the, the article underneath, and there isn't anything of the kind. All they did was go through procedural problems. But they had to put an exciting headline because that's what sells newspapers. If you're in the newspaper business, you've got to get a big headline, you see. So that's what they're doing. You read the article carefully. Analyze the article. You're not going to see any proof of anything because there isn't any. But he says, I realize this sells newspapers while the truth often seems obscure and uninteresting. But as a member of the Worldwide Church of God for a number of years, I simply cannot get the grossest of errors go unrefuted. Perhaps the most fundamental issue Mr. Timmons and company raises is, who is to determine how the church's money is spent? This member asks. The church's teaching is that financial stewardship is the responsibility of Mr. Armstrong and those to whom 
he may choose to delegate authority. If a member doesn't agree with this principle or doesn't like how the money's being spent, he's free to drop out and go find a church that is more to his own liking. Or indeed, to go start his own church and see how long it takes to build up a $50, a $50 million a year income. You know, go ahead, see how long it takes you. I'm not personally acquainted with any member who believes the church leadership is ripping off millions of dollars or the church is in the process of liquidating itself. Which brings me to another allegation in the article, namely that the Texas campus of Ambassador College is worth $30 million, but is being sold for $10 million. He says that's preposterous. Uh, well, I've talked to Mr. Helge and others, and they had a whole bunch of uh, you know estimates and so on about what it's worth, and it's sold just, well, I think he mentioned that, just for uh, the n normal fair value. We didn't make a lot of money, but we didn't lose any money. But he's, this man says that's preposterous. If that property were located in East Pasadena, it might be worth $30 million. But in East Texas, the church is fortunate to receive a third of that. And I went to school there, if that makes any difference. <laughs> he grew up there. You know, it's the, have you been there? A lot of you have. I have. It's, it's swamps. It's alligators. <laughs> I mean that. They used to have the pet alligator there in Lake Loma. It's, it's swamps and alligator country. It's not in a big city. And a lot of those old Quonset hut buildings are deteriorating. Did you know that? They've been there for years and they were deteriorating and deteriorating. It's not worth what it was even five years ago when some of those properties were newer. Is it surprising, yes, sinister, that in these times of inflation, a church our size whose primary purpose is to proclaim the gospel can no longer afford to operate two full-fledged liberal arts colleges? You know, they're trying to say, well, that's evil that we're selling them off and cutting back to one college. The church leadership is simply elected to choose or to close one of them rather than try to run both on a shoestring. I think the vast majority of my church members are quite confident that the current lawsuit will prove Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Stanley Rader, and the other church officials to be innocent of any illegalities. But if not, the offending person or persons have probably already been removed. And we hope, but with much less certainty, that a clean bill of health will silence those who, for reasons best uh, known to themselves, persist in making twisted, distorted, specious accusations against the church of God. And I just have to say, Amen. He signed, I won't mind reading the names in the newspaper. Russell Edwards. Maybe he's sitting out there. Russell Edwards. Member. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. <laughs> Good that we kind of rally once in a while to the, to the cause. And then another article underneath, another headline here in this particular page, Money Belongs to God, and this is from an outsider. This lady says, Since when it is, up to the, is it up to the Attorney General to investigate a church, quote, to see that those funds are not misused, end quote, as Judge Wiseman stated in the last Saturday Star News. If the Attorney General has jurisdiction over Armstrong's church, then he has over mine, a Presbyterian church. And any member disagrees, or excuse me, any time a member disagrees about how money is spent, all he has to do is go to the Attorney General's office and have the unlimited power to interfere, even though it destroys the church in the process. And you see, that's what I think a higher power, not any human power, may have in mind. An attack from many different sources, dissident ministers, dissident people, many different sources. How a church's money is spent is up to the governing body of the church, who are stewards for God and are answerable to Him. How can some judge who is not sensitive to the church body, has no idea of the church's theology, and wasn't ordained for that responsibility, be a responsible steward of God's resources? Whether or not these people were misusing money, in the judge's opinion, is not the point. The point is freedom of religion is gone from California if the state can appoint a judge or anyone else to tell the church what it should do and how it should spend its money. Money is given to God, not the state or the attorney general, and its purpose, excuse me, it's given to him to be used for his purposes, not the state's, to be administered as a public trust. Maybe the state thinks churches spend too much money overseas or spend too much on a sanctuary, as she calls it, you know, a church building like this building here. Have you ever been to St. Peter's? I wish the uh, attorney general would get involved there. I really do. I think that'd be very interesting. Years ago, I heard them estimate the value of St. Peter's. And they say you really can't, but the estimate that came out in news sources at that time was twelve and one half billion dollars. I read that. And if you've been there, you know that that is true. Twelve and one half billion dollars. 
not million, but billion, because of the gold, the silver, the precious stones, the artistry. The, I mean, it's, it's something that is unbelievable. If you've been there, you could put this house of God in there many, many, many times over and have room to spare. It's a huge place covered with gold and precious stones, shimmering in its beauty. The Apostle Paul wondered at great, with great admiration at the woman when he saw her all decked out, remember, in Revelation so on. Anyway, better not say too much here. <laughs> Who knows? We're talking about women and birds and bees, all kinds of things. <laughs> anyway, maybe the state thinks the church spends too much money on its sanctuary and the money should go to the, those living in poor projects or to some other, quote, worthwhile projects. But the money wasn't given to the public or to the attorney general or even the judge. It was given to God as an act of worship to be administered through his church. I thought we had a First Amendment that guaranteed freedom of religion. Perhaps I was mistaken. And she signs it, A. Virginia Munn Alhambra. And I'm grateful for, to her, a non-church member who is concerned with freedom of religion. And frankly, because some of our ex-members are perhaps even weak members, and I sympathize with you. I've let a lot of you cry on my shoulders. I understand in that sense. But because a lot kind of get mixed up, they miss the point. And that is that this is a fundamental thing, brethren, to our nation and to this church. Are we going to be able to determine ourselves how to preach the gospel under the leadership of Jesus Christ through his apostle? That is fundamental. And we do need, as Mr. Helge said, to take our stand. We really do. Back in Matthew 16, well, I, 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 I'm not going to cut this part out. I'll, I'll have to hurry here, but I'll go back. Let's not go there. I'm starting to skip Judges. <laughs> but let's go back to Judges, and I'll tell the story in my own words rather than reading it to you. Judges, the seventh chapter. You all remember the story of Gideon. Gideon was told by God to destroy and to conquer uh, these people of the Midianites. And so Gideon, in verse 1, and all the people who were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod. And the host of Midianites were on the north side. And the Eternal said to Gideon, The people that are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, We did it. We did it ourselves. And so you know the story. God had uh, Gideon tell the men, If any is faint-hearted, if you're not sure, will you just go on back home? And then after they'd gone back home, why, well, he got them over by this brook and had them drink water. And the men that were kind of uh, sitting on one knee and looking over the shoulder and were scared and were lapping, you know, dipping it up with their hand, well, then they had to go on back home. The men that were willing to bend right over and drink right out of the brook and were not afraid, why, uh, they, they stayed with Midian. And so through these processes that he went through, he cut it back from apparently an army of thousands to 300 men. And the army of Midian was obviously, by this account here, many thousands of people. He cut it back to 300 men. Verse 15, And it was so when Gideon heard uh, of this telling of what was to happen, he worshipped, returned to the host of Israel, and said, Arise, for the Eternal has delivered into your hand the host of Midian. And so he divided the 300 men into three companies. Now, 100 man, men in each company. And they didn't take any swords. They went with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said, Look to me and do likewise. You know, I'll, I'll set you examples. Watch me and do the same. And so when I blow the trumpet, then you all blow. And so they went out and the sword, and they said, When I blow, say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So, verse 19, Gideon and the hundred men with him came unto the outside of the camp at midnight. Mr. Helgi was saying the enemy in North Korea struck when they weren't expecting it. Well, that's when these men struck at midnight in the middle watch of the night. And they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hand, you see, to make a lot of noise. And the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers and held the lamps in their hands, giving the impression, you know, of a great vast army. They thought they were just the leaders holding these lamps, and there'd be lots of other men in the shadows that they couldn't see. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And these other guys got up. They were panic-stricken, and of course God did it. God did it. And they stood every man in his place and ran all around the camp and stumbled over one another. And these men came in and gave them the business. <laughs> and they won the battle. And so then finally, these other fellows were more weak. Verse 19, the men of Israel then heard about it and gathered themselves out of Naphtali and Asher and Manasseh, some of our ancestors, and pursued after the Midianites. And then later it says, verse 24, then all the men of Israel, or Ephraim, gathered themselves together and took 
uh, the waters unto Beth uh, Bera and Jordan. And they took the two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and, and Zeb, and slew them. And uh, then they brought the heads of these two men. Kind of a bloody scene. They brought them back to show the power of God. Now, brethren, maybe God is sorting us out. Maybe God is trying to see who is really going to be willing to not be faint-hearted, but to stand up for the government of God, even where there's a certain amount of fear and there's a certain amount of persecution. Maybe he's going to see who is willing to bend right over and drink from the brook and say, God is with us and God will protect us. We don't need to be afraid every step of the way and be that kind of people and that kind of army and be in the kingdom of God. So again, I say, as Mr. Helgi did, and I hope all of us can think about it this way, choose you this day whom you serve. And really, that's what we must do. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Will you serve God and the aged patriarch, the anointed of God, whom I talk to today, whose heart is in this work, who is as a father to all of us, who has built this work under Jesus Christ? Or will you follow dissidents, rumors, and get yourselves all fouled up, going off in confusion. This is a very basic issue. We are the army. And if these people expect to have carcasses, let's be sure that we are a lively army, that we are Christian soldiers. So I say to you, onward, Christian soldiers. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.